to come up and maybe make themselves available so that they're close by when I call you up. So this is the time of day when we take a few minutes to think about and reflect on what we've experienced today at our conference. And I'd like to begin by reviewing briefly the uh, events of the opening session this morning. You will recall that Fred Van Leeuwen, the General Secretary of Education International, joined us and began the day with stories, two stories, one very personal of women who were denied an education because they were poor or because they were refugees or because they just didn't have the opportunity. He spoke of his indignation at this injustice and uh, that indignation still sounded in his voice. I could still hear it. I don't think he's ever lost that sense of indignation at the injustice that, that exists in our world. Fred described the influence that Education International has had on the development of SDG 4 on education. And he highlighted the transformative excuse me, role of education in realizing women's equality. Since the inception of EI 25 years ago, the role of unions has been a very important one in advancing women's equality. The EI Status of Women Committee, the Women's Caucus, regional women's networks are all good examples of the emphasis that EI has put on women's equality. Fred emphasized that we have seen and are seeing change with increasing numbers of women in union leadership positions. Fred also noted that the tremendous sacrifices made by women trade union leaders and by teachers, some of whom have died defending the right of girls to be educated and defending women's rights. He concluded by stating that collective strength and vision are the best way to achieve gender equality. And next, we experienced our morning panel, the panel on gender, power, and leadership, and what a panel it was. Education International President Susan Hopgood, Nora Files of Ungai, Katja Iverson of Women Deliver, Sarah Louis of Snesa Morocco, and moderator Haldis Holst treated us to an in-depth exploration of the nature of power and how it can best be experienced and used, exercised for good. We heard about several definitions and dimensions of power. Direct power, the power to impose, the power that goes with the armed men that Susan Hopgood mentioned in that archaic definition of power that she referenced. That power of patriarchy that women have experienced for over 5,000 years. Power is the ability to influence the directions that things take and to bring about a desired change. Power derived from authority or position. Representative power, rooted in democratic processes, including membership and elections. Power that's claimed by taking ownership of a space, a space for discussion, advocacy, and influencing. Power that's individual or collective or both. Power as something that we learn about from role models and heroes. Power as a position from which we can advocate for change. Power that can be very visible, but also invisible, nuanced, working from behind. Power as women tend to exercise it, not as a zero-sum game, but as a process by which everyone can win. Power has very practical aspects, we learned. Who has voice? Who gets resources? Other important questions. We need to understand the basis of power and how power can grow and develop. Elections and collective representation are one example. With individual power, it's a bit it's different. 
where power can develop with education, with experience, credibility, and visibility. We need to be skilled in exercising power. Patience, risk-taking, and sound decision-making are some of those key dispositions and skills. And we heard about a few other words starting with the letter P related to power, privilege, and patriarchy. We also heard some crucial strategies for exercising power for good, for change, for bringing about women's equality. One strategy, find out who the powerful influences are, who's working from behind, and work to influence them. Target powerful institutions and make sure they take up your agenda, that it becomes part of their lifeblood. Create a movement around a goal that you set. Challenge biased structures and systems. Involve other women, especially young ones. Push for the changes you think will make a difference. Be collaborative. Always ask, with whom can we do this work? Give people you want to influence what they need, evidence, data, the investment case, for example. And remember to go for the heart and the head. And when it comes to unions, if we want women to have power and not just the women in leadership, then we have to make sure our unions are good places for women. We have to address issues that they're concerned about, both within and external to the union. We need to provide spaces for women to meet and discuss issues, then ensure that those issues that they priori prioritize are on the union table. We need to champion diversity, democracy, women's rights, and human rights, and take action every day to realize a socially and ec economically just world for everyone. So thank you to the members of that panel. It was a wonderful, wonderful thing to be part of. Yes. And so now we'll go on to the reports from the different sessions. And we will begin with the session six reports that were the key tools for leadership. So we'll start with the session on voice and public speaking. And please do introduce yourselves and say which union you're from. Yes, hi. My name is Matilda, and I'm from Lärarförbundet in Sweden. And I will report back on the session of, about public speaking with Katja Iversen. And I am now then, of course, an expert on public speaking. Um, and as all experts on public speaking know, there are three elements that are extremely important when you are speaking publicly. It is the preparation, it is the execution, and it is the evaluation, right? Yes. And so, oh, thank you. Um, before I came here, I prepared, of course, my public speech. I was thinking about where it was going to take place and what you actually wanted to hear. And I was thinking about who is sitting in this room. And yeah, what is my persona? That was also something that I was thinking about. Who am I? And which image do I want to give you about me? Um, so then I came to the execution. That's what I'm doing actually right now. Um, and well, <laughs> yeah. First of all, you have to feel the stage. And and I didn't really do that, so I'm going to like feel the stage. Yeah. <clears throat> and then you have to find a position like with your body that is actually making you comfortable that you can always return to. 
So this is my, or well, could be this as well, no. This is my comfortable position. And then you have to remember that you are here because you want to tell people something. And you have to speak slowly and loud. <laughs> and you have to start with the most important thing. And you have to remember that people won't remember things if you don't repeat them three times. Three times. Three times. <laughs> and, and don't underestimate the power of a pause. And when you're done, speaking of pauses. <laughs> Yep, sorry. Uh, when you're done, you have to evaluate. How was it? And, of course, remember to take off the mic, the microphone, because if you go to the bathroom afterwards with the microphone on, yeah, it could be complicated. And follow up and network. And remember that your speech don't have to stay in the room. It could actually go out there. It could be parts on Twitter. It could be filmed. You know, share your ideas, because you are here, because you want to change the world. Thank you, and sorry for taking time. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you. <laughs> All right, on to the session about mentoring. All right, invite our next uh, reporter. Well, we need mentoring in, in presentation. Hello everyone, and hello. I'm Hema Hariram from Neptosa in South Africa, and I'm glad to be your mentor. And I am Nishanti Bailey from the Bermuda Union of Teachers, and I am excited about being your mentee. Pleasure to meet you. You're welcome. Nishanti, um, as a mentor, I'm hoping to be able to share with you my knowledge, my experiences that I've gained at the union, in the hope that you will actually promote and help other women as well as yourself to empower women into leadership positions. Well, I am so excited about having a mentor and working with you. I know that it's going to be both formal and informal, but structured and have a purpose. As your mentee, I'm looking forward to gaining confidence and being a part of the expansion of our union's future. Certainly, Nishanti. I think this relationship will be based on mutual trust, mutual understanding and learning. And this is a first step to forming cri critical um, mass of women who will lead the unions in a renewed culture and a renewed sustainability. That sounds awesome. How about this? How about we develop a contract of mutual understanding that we can both sign as we go along with this relationship? That will be great. Awesome. And finally, can we call an EI to produce guidelines for professional development and women mentoring for, for unions. unions? Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> well, thank you. And now the session on communications and social media. Hello, my name is Eva Mangimutra. I'm from, uh, I'm president from the Danish uh, leader section from childhood care. My name is Sam Pigeon. I'm a member of the Federal Executive of the Australian Education Union. Uh, we're going to live tweet our uh, report 
and uh, Eva is going to do the tweeting while I do the report. But first of all, so that we can do this in real time, we need everyone to give a big wave so that we can get a photo for the, for the Twitter. Raise Thank you, hands, come yeah. on. Whoa. Got Thank it? you, yeah, I got it. We had a fun and really positive uh, social media session facilitated by the fantastic Francine from Canada. Uh, she began with a rationale for becoming active in social media and for using social media as an organising and communication tool, not just as something that we personally engage with. After surveying the group to gauge levels of use of different apps, uh, we were asked to form pairs and we were asked to interview our partner um, and take a photo or a video and to share that interview uh, and, and um, story via social media, either through the app uh, for this um, conference or through Twitter. So if at around 11 a.m. Or, or, or just after that this morning you noticed a lot of activity on the feed, that was all of us sharing our, uh, our interviews with each other. Um, this then organically turned into a beautiful workshop moment where experienced users helped new users to understand the world of hashtags and handles and tagging and following and trending and all of those things. And uh, where more experienced users were sharing uh, their um, approaches and ideas as well. Workshop participants were encouraged to share the ways that social media is used by their unions and organisations, and then as people continued to explore new skills and connect with each other, Francine shared more information with us regarding the fact that women around the world are big users of social media. In terms of collective leadership, social media allows us as women at the grassroots level and also in our organisations to connect with political and system leaders and with each other and importantly other influencers. It's a space that we need to be in and so we need to actively engage in this space and find ways to enable women in our organisations to make their way through the social media labyrinth. Thank you. And thank you as well. So now we'll move to the session on leading by example, work and well-being. Bonjour. Alors, comme je n'ai pas pu assister aux autres ateliers, vous m'excuserez, mais je n'en suis qu'au niveau où j'ai osé lever la main. Et puis je suis passée à l'étape 2, monter au pupitre. J'espère que ça va bien se passer. Alors, pendant l'atelier « Donner l'exemple euh, travail et bien-être », nous avons tenté de définir la notion d'équilibre entre, entre vie personnelle et travail, à la fois en tant que femme, mais aussi en tant que leader. Nous avons identifié les tensions qui émergent dans cette recherche d'équilibre toujours fragile, ainsi que les stratégies individuelles et collectives qui nous permettent d'atteindre l'équilibre entre vie personnelle et travail. L'équilibre, c'est une notion apparemment personnelle et subjective. Les premières difficultés que nous avons évoquées sont d'ordre familial, mais aussi culturel et structurel. Les femmes leaders que nous sommes doivent mener trois vies de front, et rien de moins. Euh, vie familiale, vie professionnelle, mais aussi vie syndicale. En n'ayant pas assez de temps, nous sommes donc obligés d'apprendre à mieux utiliser ce temps qui nous est précieux. Mais nous sommes obligés aussi d'être courageuses et d'être prêtes à faire des sacrifices. Être seule n'est pas forcément un avantage, loin de là, puisque seule, cela implique aussi l'absence de soutien de la part de la famille et de l'entourage au niveau émotionnel, au niveau domestique. Et c'est un sentiment qui est renforcé par les attentes de la part de nos collaborateurs qui sont bien souvent beaucoup plus importante vis-à-vis d'une femme seule que vis-à-vis d'une femme avec une charge d'enfant ou familiale. Le regard des autres a aussi une influence, et notamment le jugement porté par les hommes et par les femmes par rapport à une posture jugée transgressive par rapport aux normes sociales. Le temps digital implique également une extensivité des temps de travail et efface la frontière entre vie professionnelle et personnelle, ce qui impacte bien plus fortement les femmes. Alors, face à toutes ces difficultés peu réjouissantes, 
euh, quelle stratégie adopter. Au niveau individuel, il nous faut apprendre à dégager des priorités, prendre soin de nous, de notre santé physique, émotionnelle, et apprendre à nous protéger en nous entourant de personnes de confiance, car le burn-out n'est jamais loin. Se libérer aussi du sentiment de culpabilisation et être égoïste dans le bon sens du terme, c'est-à-dire savoir penser à soi, prendre du temps pour soi, pour pouvoir être disponible pour les autres. Être soi-même un exemple en apprenant à déterminer ce que nous sommes et ce que nous sommes en mesure de donner par rapport à ce qui est attendu de nous. D'un point de vue collectif, nous devons développer des partenariats et nous rapprocher de la société civile par rapport à ce qu'on attend de nous. Ok. Euh, il nous faut également mettre des quotas, car plus de femmes dans un syndicat, cela signifie une meilleure prise en compte des différentes temporalités. Il nous faut également réaliser des campagnes de sensibilisation et surtout revoir l'organisation interne à nos syndicats. Nous acceptons des modes de fonctionnement dans nos syndicats que nous ne tolérerions jamais de la part de nos patrons. C'est pour ça qu'il nous faut absolument impulser des modes de travail collaboratifs qui profiteront à toutes et à tous. Merci beaucoup. And the next group, recognizing and addressing implicit bias. Good afternoon. My name is Angel Heiliger from the Bermuda Union of Teachers in Bermuda. Ours was facilitated by Olivia Brown, the federal women's officer from the Australian Education Union. Our discussion began with a video by Michael Kimmel, who noted that privilege is invisible to people who have it. This also could be said about bias. Bias is an inherent part of the human experience. An implicit bias is the root cause of entrenched gender inequality. So what are we going to do about it? We looked at what is meant by stereotypes, attitude, and explicit bias, which refers to the attitudes and beliefs we have about a person or group on a conscious level. Implicit bias is attitude, or stereotypes that affect our understanding, actions, and decisions in an unconscious manner. And it's based on the cumulative effect of everything you've been exposed to in your entire life. It, can, it is automatic or involuntary, it's outside of our awareness, it's pervasive, and can predict behavior. The effects of implicit bias for women in leadership lead to entrenched historical views of gender roles, discrimination, gender stereotypes, and the glass ceiling. We can identify implicit bias in our unions and schools by investigating the structures for embedded practices and attitudes that discriminate against women and thwart strategies to improve diversity by knowing your own implicit bias. What does this mean? Implicit bias. Why does it matter? It informs our intentions with others. It creates barriers that impede access to opportunity across social domains, such as education, health, and criminal justice. It can lead to transformational activism, which is making people aware of their behavior, transforming their internal biases, and reinforcing the behaviors that we actually want them to have. You're encouraged to tune into implicit bias in your school by asking yourselves, where do I see implicit biases playing out in my school? What fear or apprehension do I have about addressing this issue? And how can I be an ally to colleagues, students, and families who experience bias in our schools? Addressing implicit bias is specifically about doing internal change work required to make the external change work possible. This can be achieved by exposure to counter stereotypes, habitual practice, taking the perspective of others, using your privilege to create equity 
and education and aware awareness. Education plus action equals change. Thank you very much. So now we'll move on to reports from session seven this afternoon on women's professional leadership. And we'll start with the session on education support personnel. Hello, I'm Jill Christensen from the National Education Association. In the session on education support personnel, we heard from Sonia Etier, Premier Vice President de CSQ Quebec, Canada. Sonia is the Premier, the first Vice President of the CSQ Union of Canada. Her union's made up of four federations, 200 job categories of support workers, which means 40,000 workers across Quebec. She shared that 60% of them are women, and issues that we hear about very often, casualization, privatization, and poverty, not receiving a living wage, all impact support workers in Quebec. In our workshop, we had 11 participants from the Australian Education Union, a Moroccan NGO, Zamb the unions of Zimbabwe, Zambia, and the United States. We were framed or pitched six questions that would help clarify some of the themes and topics that will be addressed in the May conference, May 2018, in Brussels, on support personnel workers. They were questions about what is it like in your country for support workers in education? Is there a feminization or challenges based on gender for support workers? How does it relate to quality education? Well, what about leadership within the union movement? What kind of relationship do you have with teachers and professors? And of course, pay equity. We realize that really, teachers and professors and support workers can either be at odds with each other and competing for what they see as limited resources, or they can find ways to collaborate and work together. That's, in fact, our challenge, how we do that to support quality education. We had a beautiful example from Tasmania, from the Independent Education Union in Australia, of, in fact, how the teachers supported the support workers who were in a separate union in their struggle to get paid during holiday time. They were able to win it because, in fact, the teachers joined the support workers. They saw the value in quality education, that, in fact, the children of those support workers, they deserved food and a roof over their heads. So again, fighting for fair wages for women. Lastly, and that is that we heard that EI is in the process of completing research on support workers in education that I think can inform all of us. Thank you. Thank you. And now the session on early childhood education. Buenas tardes. Me, me tocó compartir escenario con Oliva, una compañera que está con nosotros. Soy Rosa Urania de la Cruz Ovalle, de FAPROAS, Santo Domingo, sindicato que es de profesores universitarios. Nos tocó compartir con nuestra compañera palestina, Mais Changlet, que nos explicó el contexto en que vive la infancia en su país, Palestina. Ella tocó varios aspectos fundamentales, contextuales de su país, pero se enfocó más bien en la situación de la primera infancia en Palestina. Nos contaba que en su país los niños viven atemorizados, 
producto de la descomposición político-social, un país ocupado, un país donde los niños reciben la instrucción bajo el sonido de fusiles disparar no es tan fácil. Ella nos contaba que en su país, su gremio, ¿verdad?, que ella representa, ella es la única mujer que liderea un sindicato de, de esa etapa de la educación y nos decía que ella ha logrado incorporar su sindicato a otros gremios o a otros sindicatos para fortalecerlo. Nos decía que es muy difícil la situación porque son estancias privadas donde no se desarrolla realmente lo que el niño debe adquirir a esas edades. Tengo múltiples aquí eh, apuntes sobre todo lo que habló, pero el tiempo es muy medido y voy a pasar a mi compañero Olivia, quien nos va a contar lo que son las, las diferentes opiniones que después de la exposición de la compañera Mais eh, aportaron los demás participantes. Muchas gracias. Gracias, hermana Rosa. Yo hablo un poco español. <laughs> Uh, on completion of Mace Jamali's report on the state of early child education in Palestine, the session was open for discourse on issues and obstacles faced in other regions. I would like to point out that early child education is the most important of all of the teaching years. Sisters and brothers from Denmark, Kenya, Ghana, Mauritania and Spain shared their experiences. Common issues of the early child education sector in many of these countries is that the early child education years are the most neglected years of education, often left to privateering by private, provided, by private providers with limited access provided to those children in low socioeconomic demographics, or in other words, to those children who need it the most. Often our early child education workers in private providers are exploited, receiving below minimum wage, high rates of casualization, and precarious work, and not surprisingly low, low rates of unionization. There is low or no standards regulating curriculum, uh, uh, curriculum content, particularly in relation to play-based pedagogies. Recommendations for government to address issues within the early child education sector include increased government support highlighting the importance of the early childhood education sector, which is the most important of all the teaching years. Integration of kindergarten or preschool within the public education, education system, which is wholly the responsibility of government. Quality standards for the early child education curriculum. Equal opportunity to the access of early childhood education in, particularly, in particular for children from disadvantaged backgrounds. Early childhood education centers should be located so low, into low socioeconomic areas. Compulsory early childhood education. Improved salaries for early childhood education workers and diversity training included in the tertiary qualifications of early childhood educators, including social inclusion, tolerance, gender roles, and cultural di diversity. If I've learned anything, early childhood education is the most important of all the teaching years. Muchas gracias. Muchas gracias. And now the session on primary education. Buenas tardes. Soy Fátima Xavi del Sindicato Nacional de la Enseñanza Superior Marruecos. Bueno, el taller de esta mañana fue un seminario bajo el título Liderazgo Sindical de las Mujeres en la Educación Pública, Acciones Estratégicas Implementadas desde AND, a cargo de la profesora Carmen Brenes. Pérez, secretaria general de esta Asociación Nacional de Educadores. La ponencia trató tres puntos esenciales que marcaron tres etapas claves del dominio de la educación en Costa Rica. El primer punto fue un recorrido histórico sobre la creación del sector educativo que remonta a las tres últimas décadas del siglo XIX, 
eh, punto en que se hizo hincapié sobre el carácter común, público y gratuito de la educación en Costa, en Costa Rica. El segundo punto era, eh, habló de la situación de la mujer relacionada con este dominio de la, eh, de la educación, es decir, la mujer docente, que tiene a su carga la construcción de la sociedad de Costa Rica, claro, de Costa Rica, tanto en el ámbito familiar como en el ámbito educativo escolar y eh, por eh, su lucha permanente y también su lucha permanente en el seno de los sindicatos para poder lograr más derechos y ocupar más espacio. La mujer en Costa Rica se hace cada vez más presente en puestos de jefatura en muchos dominios. También su presencia es demasiado, eh, eh, demasiado importante en los sindicatos, pero en estos sindicatos ocupa menos espacio de toma de decisión. El tercer punto consiste en las pers perspectivas y estrategias. Las primeras trataban o tratan de la propuesta política de salud relacionada con la educación. Las segundas, es decir, las estrategias tratan de fortalecer eh, la participación masiva de las mujeres y fomentar sus capacidades y también fortalecer el trabajo sindical y sobre todo eh, en las mujeres. Y esto a través de acciones militantes en, con el apoyo del gobierno a veces y otras veces con el apoyo de organismos de la sociedad civil. Esta última colabora mediante actividades y acciones culturales y artísticas para mujeres y alumnas. Después de esta ponencia muy interesante, el coordinador eh, propuso, del, del taller propuso un ejercicio muy interesante, colectivo, que se hizo por tres grupos homogéneos desde el punto de vista lingüístico, pero, eh, pero con diferentes eh, países. Es decir, las, las mujeres asistentes eran de diferentes países. El primer grupo, por ejemplo, consta de países de Noruega, Suecia, Brasil. Eh, perdón, eh, el primer grupo, Uruguay, Suecia, Brasil y Marruecos. Segundo grupo, Zambia, India, Uganda. Siria, Nigeria y Marruecos, tercer grupo, eh, Sudáfrica, Inglaterra y Escocia. Eh, el, 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 fue, eh, terminó, el ejercicio fue el siguiente, en tanto que mujeres líderes, ¿cuáles serían las estrategias para resolver la situación de la mujer en vuestras regiones? El resultado del taller ha sido muy interesante en la medida en que cada grupo pudo sobre, sublevar las prioridades de los problemas a resolver en favor de la situación de la mujer y de su emancipación en su sociedad, en una sociedad que la reconoce y que le reconoce sus competencias y su humanidad. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Gracias. And now the session on secondary education. Bonsoir, mesdames. Bonsoir, messieurs, bien sûr. Je tiens à remercier euh, l'International de l'enseignement pour, la, 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 pour ces deux jours formidables dans les, à partir duquel on a eu des messages qui sont très positifs, on a été motivés, on a eu des messages de force et de, pour, euh, de promotion pour toutes les femmes dans tous les pays du monde. Euh, pour notre atelier, L'atelier, c'était « Femmes leaders à l'enseignement secondaire ». Il a été modéré par Mme Soumiyer Yahi, euh, femme du Bureau national, syndicat national de l'enseignement secondaire, partie de la Fédération démocratique du travail au Maroc. Et euh, pour moi, je, me, je suis toujours dans le même syndicat, euh, euh, syndicat national de l'enseignement de la FDT, membre du Bureau national. Au début, la, Madame Soumeya nous a fait une introduction pour donner une image de la femme leader dans l'enseignement secondaire au Maroc. Elle a commencé par des statistiques. Généralement, la femme marocaine dans l'enseignement secondaire est moins représentée au poste de responsabilité. Il existe un grand écart entre la féminisation dans la profession de l'enseignement secondaire 
et la féminisation au niveau des postes de responsabilité. Par exemple, au niveau des de femmes enseignantes en secondaire, le Maroc possède à peu près 34 des femmes. Mais pour les postes de responsabilité au niveau du secondaire, on n'en a que 24 Pour les femmes de l'encadrement pédagogique au niveau du secondaire, on n'a que 6 des femmes. Donc on constate bien que plus qu'on monte dans l'échelon de la profession au niveau du secondaire, que le taux de femmes au poste de responsabilité diminue. Dans l'enseignement, on sait bien que c'est un secteur caractérisé par l'inégalité au niveau du Maroc. L'inégalité, je pense bien que euh, euh, dans n'importe quel pays sous-développé, par l'inégalité des sexes au poste de pouvoir. Mais néanmoins, l'accès de certaines femmes à certains postes de responsabilité est déjà une lueur d'un pas vers un changement et un critère d'une démocratie. L'atelier, on a, on a été d'accord pour travailler sur trois objectifs. D'abord, à déterminer entre groupes les freins des femmes pour accéder au poste de pouvoir. Deuxième point à discuter, c'était comment on perçoit l'image d'une femme leader. Et le troisième point à discuter, c'était repérer et proposer des bonnes pratiques et des procédures réussies à ce niveau. Pour le, le premier point, les freins des femmes pour accéder au pouvoir, on a dégagé que ce sont généralement les stéréotypes créés par des sociétés masculines en ce qui concerne la division du rôle au foyer et donc la non-disponibilité des femmes entre sa division entre le travail au niveau de son foyer, sa profession et au niveau syndical et ne disons pas qu'il a des loisirs. Deuxièmement, il existe plusieurs organisations gouvernementales qui possèdent un grand effectif féminin, mais elles sont dirigées que par les hommes. L'éducation familiale et scolaire, qui sont à l'opposé aux gens, joue un rôle actif pour stabiliser les stéréotypes dominants pour le rôle de la femme. Dans certains pays, on a, fait, on a pu diagnostiquer qu'on fait un pas en avant dans la, 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 la promotion des femmes et l'émancipation des droits des femmes, mais on fait en même temps des pas en arrière à cause de l'image négative médiatisée par les médias, surtout dans les, les médias, de, de, les Facebook et Twitter, etc. Pour le deuxième objectif, comment on perçoit les femmes leaders Généralement, on attend, à cause des stéréotypes, qu'on a des modèles féminins que les femmes doivent être tenues et, comme des hommes et cachent leur féminité. Mais on s'est mis d'accord dans le, notre atelier que le modèle, c'est la femme qui le crée par sa personnalité, son comportement et ses attitudes et que nous devrons être pionnières vis-à-vis -vis du modèle féminin au pouvoir. Pour le troisième point, quelles sont les bonnes pratiques, les procédures et les exemples réussis à ce niveau Premièrement, rester féminine, avoir confiance en soi et sans, euh, euh, exercer le mentoring entre les différentes générations des femmes. Il faut identifier au niveau syndical les postes de responsabilité, encourager les femmes à postuler pour ces postes, les former et les accompagner. Chercher à modifier des lois pour la participation des femmes au pouvoir, faire le plaidoyer féminin. Exerçant de réseautage entre les départements des femmes, entre les syndicats compatibles avec nos objectifs évolutifs pour faire accéder des femmes au pouvoir. Et en conclusion, on doit surmonter les freins intérieurs et extérieurs et avoir confiance en soi et l'estime de soi. Si je suis au pouvoir, c'est parce que je le mérite autant que femme sensuelle, intellectuelle et combattante. Et merci. Pardon pour... Merci. And the next uh, session was vocational education and training. Um, I want to say I'm Rosa Tienopio from Kenya. Uh, I want to present on uh, what we came out with. Thank you, my group members, for allowing me to distill the points that we came out with. In terms of higher education, we found out that the higher education has 
really a collective of uh, human resource and the powerhouse, really a hub of people who can be mentors for young scholars. So when we talk about mentorship, you can get women there. And therefore, these are women who have defied all the odds, they have debunked all the myths that higher education is just going to be saturated by men. And then we also realize that one potential that we can tap from the higher education is the fact that we are research oriented, we are investigators, we can come with evidence-based statistics that can inform issues to do with gender-based violence, issues to do with um, issues that are affecting women and gender studies in general. The other thing that we also found out that is that university uh, education and higher education in general, there is no critical mass of women that can uh, push the agenda of women forward. Women researchers and workers in higher education setup are very few. They are not represented in boardrooms. They are not represented in various committees and senates. And when they are there, one voice is very difficult to come out uh, powerfully. The dilemma that we came out with in that kind of criteria is that how can we make the voice be louder of that one woman in the boardroom? The other thing that we came out with is that university is highly autonomous. There is uh, the myth or of academic freedom, but we find out that this is not really coming out clearly. These are uh, spots of discrimination, skewed appointment, skewed promotional criteria, why we see a lot of women are not gaining access to powerful uh, uh, committees and uh, departments, why they are usually given soft, soft kind of departments related to social issues, you can be in a dean of students because people think you are going to be really emotional and helping students. But you may not find yourself in disciplinary committees where decisions have to be made very quickly. So this highly structural and hierarchical um, uh, arrangement in universities is really creating a lot of high expectations for women and really causing a lot of attrition of women in leadership. The other thing we found out was there's a lot of academic vigor uh, in universities. There is a lot, you publish or you perish. And this really doesn't augur well with a woman because we know we get into the higher education really with a lot of baggage in our, uh, in our backs. And therefore, there are no, there are very stringent rules. All the policies are already outlined. We need to really compete with men. In grant proposal writing, the criteria is very clear. Apparently, what also came out in that discussion is that uh, with the age limits, uh, philanthropists or education sympathizers and enthusiasts, those who are championing for education all over, they give more attention to niche areas where men are saturated. And therefore, we find ourselves lacking in uh, research support. We find ourselves having still a glass ceiling in the type of uh, research that we carry. Then the last one is about... Uh, the, the, the last one is about budgetary cuts and uh, shrinking financial base. We find out that there is a lot of new liberal, uh, uh, highly funding systems have become really privatized. And therefore, it means uh, people go for the niche areas they think they are. Uh, and today, when you look at the niche areas, they are highly saturated and intensive in terms of uh, men dominated fields. Like when you talk about nanotechnology, when you talk about nanotechnology, you see a lot of natural science and technology. When you find that women are not there. So what is it that IE can help us in terms of championing, championing for leadership and research in higher education? The last uh, one is about um, the issue, the dilemma that you brought about uh, in terms of employment, in terms of union activities, universities are really finding a serious challenge. Today, there is increasing push towards con contractual employment. And this is really making us have a very difficult situation in championing union movement. We have a lot of our members who are on contractual jobs. And therefore, because of the, uh, the ability to have PhD for a woman is usually a very difficult thing. And therefore, we don't have our members. There's a lot of apathy around. When you call members for action, they don't come because they, they think job security is very important. We are asking the following for IE consideration. 
we need a lot of networks and programs that are really sympathizing with women in higher education for career progress uh, and for research leadership. We also need us to uh, consciously think about specific programs within our unions that can enhance leadership in research and higher education. Thank you. Thank you. I believe that was the report for higher ed and research. So we'll go to the report, the last one, for vocational education and training. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Katrina Blivatje from Union of Education Norway. The topic was introduced by two colleagues from UCU, the Union for University and College Teachers in UK. We saw through the preparation presenta presentation that their tendencies that they are facing, we see globally. Vocational education and training in UK is a huge sector and includes a lot of different students and schools adult education, vocational education in more sectors, and university education. Some positive and negative tendencies in the sector in UK were mentioned. A plus, there are high proportion of women leaders in the further education, which is good news. But there is a pay gap, almost 80%. Uh, women face problems with the work-life balance. 40% uh, more work by women than men. But uh, recently the government brought shared paternity leave um, and hopefully that will bring some cultural change. Uh, that means that employers' attitude when it comes to payment for both mothers and fathers will perhaps change. That is what our colleagues hope. Um, there are also risks using ICT. It creates additional work time since there is a tendency that the employer is expected to work day in and day out. The UK, the UK colleagues have a perception that if more female leaders, if, if more female leaders, the better, and I have problems with, yes, uh, the better we can change the working conditions. Then we went on to the student situation. The labor market segregation in terms of vocational subjects is a global phenomenon that reduces the students' possibilities to choose what they really want because there are social barriers to combat gender stereotypes in vocational education and in the labor market. The causes for that we find in peer pressure, parental pressure, social image, all these have an influence on young people. Uh, this is just a summary, so <laughs> causes to this is, of course, labor market segregation in the university. Women get less points on terms of career for the same task. Career patterns uh, uh, of women, career interruptions, Women undersell themselves, they are more polite. Women are dispropor disproportionately in a precarious employment. Bargaining for school teachers is on the level on the school or on, in, mun in municipalities, and therefore salaries are highly deregulated in many countries. Okay, then I get to the three points. <laughs> what can trade unions do? Working with NGOs and open society, doing trainings for young women, there is important to have visible role models in the different areas. Until we have that, there is a need for good career guidance in schools, influencing wider cultural and traditional thinking in society, and unions should progress gender equality, including pay, sexual harassment in the politics, and in training of the union reps. Thank you. Thank you, and thank you to all of the rapporteurs. So before we close our day, there are just a few things left to do. I'd like to ask Kathy Wallace to stand. She's just right over here. 
Kathy reminded me or told me today that this is the 100th anniversary of the passing of the Representation of the Peoples Act in 1918 in the United Kingdom, which allowed women to have the vote. And Kathy's grandmother is uh, one of the imprisoned suffragettes who um, gave her time, her heart, and her uh, health to try to make that happen. So uh, if you wish to know more about it, Kathy is there, and believe me, she has some great stories about it. I also want to acknowledge that today is the National Day of the Sami people, who are the indigenous people of Norway, Finland, Sweden, and Russia. We now have a brief video that Sharon Burroughs, who is the General Secretary of the International Trade Union Confederation, uh, has sent. She has a message for us. Greetings. I very much regret not being with you, particularly given it's the 25th anniversary of the Education International. I was there at the birth. You have built a magnificent international union movement and as teachers, you hold a very special place in the healing that we must do now in a fractured world. There is no doubt that education is at the core of opportunity, it's at the core of civilization, it's the, at the core of the dialogue we need to have in order to shape our world, both healing the fractures of today, but building the capacity and the confidence to manage both the imperative of climate action, which will change all of our industrial base, and indeed, of course, the uh, opportunities and threats from technology. You have an enormous role to play. I know that as uh, women union leaders, both in your profession and in the union, it's not easy to navigate many of these pathways but your leadership is more vital than ever. For the ITUC, we have a program called Count Us In for Women. It's a very clear message to our brothers, to governments, to leaders everywhere. Count women into the economy. It's not only just, it's the fastest way to, to grow our uh, nation's productivity and indeed to make sure it's inclusive growth. In order to do that, of course, we need to invest in the care economy. That means you, aged care, childcare, health, and of course, education. We know that that delivers good jobs. We know it delivers uh, jobs in other areas of the care economy, and certainly it frees women to participate in the broader economy. But we also have a message about counting us into our unions and counting us into leadership everywhere. I've said repeatedly, that it's not enough for women just to be CEOs or on the boards of uh, uh, companies or indeed leaders in our international institutions. All of this is important. But if women aren't represented equally across all indicators, from equal pay to participation in the workforce to actually leadership in all areas of life, then we are not building an inclusive, a just, or an equal society. You have an enormous role to play to help us make that happen. Trade unions are on the front lines. We have a workforce that is extraordinarily fragile. When you look at the uh, three billion people or so in the global workforce, our brothers and sisters, then only 60% of them are in formal work. And even then more than half of those are in insecure work, short-term contracts, low pay, often unsafe. And 40% uh, of our brothers and sisters are in the informal economy. They have no rights, no minimum wages, no rule of law. So this is not a workforce that we can actually build a secure future on. And then, of course, we have up to 45 million of uh, those brothers and sisters in modern slavery. And we're very proud to be on the front lines of fighting modern slavery, just as we are to fight corporate greed, to clean up globalisation. But we must ensure 
that we have the knowledge base of a broad and deep education, an education for everybody, plus of course the skills and the lifelong learning vital for that future. So I'm proud to say that I, uh, my history is as a teacher. I was a leader of the Teachers Union in Australia and a Vice President of Education International. So I consider myself one of your uh, ranks, if no longer practising. I admire what you do every day, both in the schools and in your union. You have an enormous strength. You have the absolute advantage of education. That's a privilege. So your leadership is vital. I wish you well. I look forward to the uh, deliberations and the outcomes of this Congress. Women are holding up more than half the sky in many areas. So all strength to you. Congratulations and solidarity. So just a quick reminder to leave your headsets out in the hallway and I declare the second day of our conference closed. <laughs>